Hello, Belle. Bonjour, Gaston. Gaston, may I have my book, please? How can you read this? There's no pictures. Yes. Well, some people use their imagination. Belle, it's about time you got your head out of those books and paid attention to more important things. Like me. Yes! The whole town's talking about it. It's not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking. Yes! Come to Papa! Now, being a recent graduate from film school can have a lot of drawbacks, like having a useless piece of paper that costs $500,000, and not being able to get a job unless you know somebody, and probably being seen as a mistake child, but it also comes with its perks, like being able to analyze films made for kids. Still kind of useless, I know, but I think I'm way better at analyzing a movie than John Doyle. Hi, how are you? John Doyle, if you don't know, is a conservative YouTube commentator who has some questionable beliefs. There's no such thing as women's rights. I beg your pardon? We have rights as human beings. You do not get exclusive rights simply because you are a woman. Women's rights? Throw them in the trash. Wait. Really? But recently he released a video called Why Beauty and the Beast is Implicitly Right Wing. Like I said, so being a film student, this caught my eye. So I decided to watch it, and it was pretty bad. Listen, I am all for coming up with weird theories to movies. Like, the way you view a movie is just like, Your opinion, man. But John Doyle completely disregards parts of the movie to make it fit his narrative. Which is not good film analysis. So let's take this video step by step. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. What was that? Talk about idealizing the nuclear family. This man just decided to recreate it for an intro. Just in awe watching how based Gaston is and how implicitly right wing this whole story is. And this girl, she had to witness the most eccentric behavior. Eccentric, not autistic, eccentric. I don't find you funny. When you view this story objectively, it becomes very clear that the true antagonist of the film is actually Belle. So, uh, no. Objectively, Belle is the protagonist. You actually admit this earlier in the video. Anyone who watches this film will easily identify Gaston as the antagonist. This story is basically about this, like, miserable proto-feminist seeking to invert virtually every aspect of her reality. That the movie has a feminist bend to it, which I guess is true in the sense that it's teaching kids to accept their abnormality. But if we're looking at the film in an objective film analysis point of view, then Belle is the protagonist. Belle, who's manifested some form of pathological narcissistic personality disorder, plain and simple. Bro, are we watching the same movie? Like, how is Belle the narcissist? When Gaston literally has an entire song dedicated to how great he is. And it sings of a tale as old as time, Beauty and the Beast. And we hear this and we think, Oh, it must be the Beauty and the Beast that we can see on the screen, but it's not. The film is inviting us to read between the lines. Mrs. Potts is warning us. Think about it. A tale as old as time. This is in reference to the beginning of male-female relationships along with time itself, which of course would bring us back to Genesis and the Garden of Eden. And what do we learn from that story? That the woman's nature, if left unchecked by strong male authority, will lead towards chaos and evil. Uh, John? I don't think Mrs. Potts is referring to Adam and Eve. I think she is supposed to be referring to love, or like, romantic love. Romantic love is a tale as old as time. It might even possibly be referring to marriage. Like, you gotta remember, this is a kid's movie, John. It's going to be more simple than referring to Adam and Eve. Potts is not singing about the Bible. Because when we first meet Belle, she's lost. And this is because she has no male influence in her life to guide her. Her father's weak, he's old, which is why that relationship is established before the interactions with Gaston and the Beast even become larger parts of the story. Because from the beginning, the whole story is about Belle desperately needing masculine guidance. So you make a statement that she doesn't have any male influence in her life, and then in the next sentence, you refer to her father. Hmm, so it does sound like she has some sort of male influence. Also, you say that Belle is lost, but she isn't lost. She's alone. There's a difference between needing guidance and wanting companionship. It's just that I'm not sure I fit in here. There's no one I can really talk to. 
Oh, what about that Gaston? He's a handsome fella. He's handsome, all right, and rude and conceited and... Belle doesn't need masculine guidance. She just wants somebody to understand her. Beauty and the Beast are both within Belle, and the struggle in the story is between the two competing forces which will decide which one will embody her essence. Will it be a strong, capable, charismatic, and therefore beautiful man to bring out her beauty? Or will it be an insecure, pathetic, hideous beast, like literal creature, that will fail to control her, which will leave her miserable? So let's not point out the fact that you just said that Belle needs to be controlled. Like, I don't want to call you sexist or anything. Like, the film is very obviously trying to subvert the whole beautiful man saves the beautiful girl from the beast. The goal of the story is to switch that situation to make it stand out from other fairy tales. So when John Doyle points out the appearances of Beast and Gaston, it's very clear that the theme of the movie went right over his head. You know, that true beauty is within and not on the outside. Very cheesy, I know, but this is a kid's movie. So it starts out by describing how exactly the beast came to be. And basically what happened was this poor, ugly old prince said no because she was ugly and poor. And at first you might think that this is based because she had poor physiognomy, but it wasn't. It was actually proto beautiful princess. And the prince immediately starts simping for her. So it wasn't a rejection of her because he inferred from her poor physiognomy that she would have poor character, but rather that he couldn't just like he began simping. And the princess realized that he was this pathetic coomer. And so she punished him by turning him into a furry, which is like an advanced stage of sexual degeneracy. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. A noble aristocrat would feel an obligation towards the lower classes and would help them out. Like Gaston, for example. Gaston is nice to his dysgenic manlet friends. In fact, he's basically his sidekick. All right, so this is not true, and I seriously question his definition of friendship if this is what he thinks it is. Gaston is pretty abusive to his friend LeFou. Gaston literally hits him multiple times throughout the movie. <laughs> Wrestling match, nobody fights like a star. <laughs> and also forces him to stand out in the snow for potentially several days. Lafu, don't move from that spot until Belle and her father come home. But, but, I At the very least, Beast became a better person by the end of the movie and stopped treating people so poorly. She has no mother figure present. Her father figure is weak. So basically, the people who were supposed to introduce her to the world help her understand how it works, what her role is. They failed to do that. Why does she have to have a role? Why can't she just live her life the way she wants to? When people are born, do they have to stay in their little box? And the villagers are singing, you know, that girl's so peculiar. She's not like other girls. Yeah, because she rejects her role in the village. Everybody in the village has a job. They are all unseparated from the products of their labor, but not Belle. No, she feels entitled to more than that. So like, where are you getting this from? She doesn't want to tear down the system. In fact, she might even want to be a part of the system so she could fit in more, but she doesn't and she accepts that. And she realizes in that moment, the gravity of her decisions, and that maybe she should have stopped being so dramatic. And in fact, I will be making the argument that her entire voluntary captivity in the Beast's castle was just one giant shit test for Gaston. What? Belle ended up in the castle because she found her dad there. I can pretty much guarantee you that Gaston was the furthest thing away from her mind. And so he greets her, and he takes her book, and he asks, how can you read this? There isn't any pictures. And she says, well, some people use their imagination, and this is the essence of Gaston. He values the objective, what he can see, what he knows is true and real. John, come on. Come on, man. You cannot be saying that when you have a literal statue of Jesus sitting on your desk. He values the objective, what he can see, what he knows is true and real. And he says, it's not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking because Gaston understands that the woman is particularly vulnerable to the whispers of the serpent. Are we? 
still talking about the movie, I get the feeling John has a certain hatred built up towards a certain sex. Belle leaves to go help her father, and LeFou makes some joke about him, and then Belle gets angry, so Gaston berates his dysgenic manlet friend and defends Belle's father, because even though Gaston recognizes that Belle's father is a weak man, he still respects tradition and hierarchy, that her father still has ownership of her. Towards the beginning of the movie, Gaston literally laughs at and insults Belle's dad. I have to get home to help my father. Goodbye. <laughs> that crazy old moon, he needs all the help he can get. <laughs> don't talk about my father that way. Yeah, don't talk about her father that way. Beta! And towards the end of the movie, Gaston literally tries to lock up Belle's dad in an insane asylum just so he can marry Belle. So you want me to throw her father into the asylum unless she agrees to marry you? Now, what is so respectful about that? So Belle gets back home and we learn that her father is an inventor, which in context means that this guy is literally facilitating the propagation of the Industrial Revolution, which will inevitably destroy the fabric of the town he's a part of through automation, through degeneration. John, do you not like technology? If you think that the Industrial Revolution was such a bad thing, then why don't you live your life without technology? Go look like a socialist. Then her father leaves to go to the fair and literally goes down the wrong path as a result of his pride and his unwillingness to delay gratification by taking a longer path against the instincts of the horse, which knew it was dangerous, by the way. And then he asks his horse, well, where have you taken us? Because he is literally incapable of accepting personal responsibility. It's a joke, John. It's a joke. So then he gets chased by wolves into the castle. He meets the props and he asks, well, how was this accomplished? Because he is incapable of or unwilling to acknowledge the immaterial, that there's clearly witchcraft at play. Well, you should like that, John. You praised Gaston earlier in this video for saying that he only accepts the objective. So why not with Belle's father? And this is the essence of Gaston. He values the objective, what he can see, what he knows is true and real, because he is incapable of or unwilling to acknowledge the immaterial, that there's clearly witchcraft at Play. Then he goes inside Belle's house to tell her about his ideal future, how they're married, how he's providing her with fresh food to cook, how he gives her seven sons. Yeah, and he also wants to give her his dick. But seriously though, you left out so much detail. Like how Gaston literally corners Belle to get her to marry him. No, she tells him that she doesn't deserve him, which is another test. And if you've ever courted a young woman, you'll recognize this test. This is her trying to get you to tell her how great she is. But then she publicly humiliates him by throwing him into a mud puddle. No, Gaston falls into a mud puddle after trapping Bell, which if you ever quartered a woman, you would know that's generally not a good idea. This is the message of the film, and it backfires spectacularly, as we'll explain later on. But it's like, think about that. I want more, I want more. She runs away from this organized wedding. She didn't have to lift a finger. The greatest man in the village, and probably the entire country of France at this point, frankly. Maybe she just doesn't like Gaston. Should she marry Gaston just to bring order to her life? See, this is what John gets so wrong about Belle. Belle is not rejecting the idea of marriage. She is rejecting marrying Gaston, which I'm sure blows John's mind. A girl not liking a muscular guy? How is that possible? You stupid one. Belle explains in the movie that she wants to marry the right guy. Oh, Papa, he's not for me. Not what society believes is the objective best guy for her. Belle offers to take the place of her father, and the Beast agrees if she promises to stay there forever. And at this point, her father, who, yeah, he's not a strong figure in her life, but even he's like, Belle, what are you doing? Don't do this. And it just goes to show how women will literally destroy their own lives just to spite standards that they think are oppressive. It's to save her father. She's not risking her life as a way to spite society. And you can say, oh, she did it to save her father, but it's like, first of all, this is 1700s, 1800s France, and that guy is old and fat. He's sick now. He's got like maybe two years left. Okay, dude, I'm gonna bring you back down to earth this is a kid's movie. I think you are seriously analyzing the objectiveness of this movie a little bit too much. She's actually contesting her father by disobeying his authority over her and doing so by masquerading it with the typically masculine virtue of sacrifice. She's literally LARPing one of those books that she never should have been reading in the first place, frankly. You know, I honestly don't even know what to say at this point. Belle assumed authority over her father by sacrificing herself for him, which objectively was a bad move, and now she's crying about it in a room by herself. This is what happens when women are allowed to think for themselves. So if you didn't think John Doyle was a sexist up until this moment, I hope that statement changes your mind. And Gaston's feeling a little bit down after the whole Belle situation earlier, and so the fellas cheer him up by singing a song about how much of a chat he is. Like, they literally have a song dedicated to how epic he is. All the men want to be him, all the women want him. Like I said earlier in the video, Gaston is the narcissistic one. He sings the song 
dedicated to himself. And you know what? If he is such a Giga Chad and can get any woman he wants, why doesn't he just do that? If Belle doesn't want you, pick up one of the other beautiful girls in the village. You know, rather than marry somebody that doesn't even like you. And it's like, if he's the villain, why am I rooting for him? If he's the villain, why is everyone rooting for him? He's drinking with the boys. He's wrestling with the boys. He's singing with the boys. He's playing chess with the boys. He's spitting with the boys. He's shooting with the boys. He's punching the boys. <laughs> I mean, this guy is it. He's loved by his community. He rejects books and sources because those are how weak people justify their beliefs since they're incapable of original thought. So you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. John Doyle rejects sources and books. So every fact that comes from a source, reject that shit. Have an original thought, commie. Literally. He doesn't even have the typical like, I'm evil and I want to do evil things. Like yes, he does. You literally show an evil image of him in your video. Tell me that's not the stereotypical evil look. First it was a hero complex. Now it's this, I'm too good to get in trouble for doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing mentality. So she makes a promise to stay there forever, breaks the rules, decides she's not at fault, and then breaks the commitment. Like this is literally how no fault divorce works. She doesn't know what's good for for her. She always wants more. She's always too good for whatever environment she's in. Once again, are we still watching the same movie? Or is this just your hatred towards women? Then he gives her a whole library, like the biggest library you've ever seen. And that should tell you all you need to know right there. Like literally the Chad don't read books versus the virgin. Um, here, take all of them. So it's Chad to restrict women from reading, but virgin to give them a gift. Like why? She's literally trying to normalize bestiality to herself. White women and bestiality. Talk about a tale as old as time. I will not elaborate on this. Yeah, please don't. And so the beast releases Belle so that she can go back to being with her still sick and dying father. And like, as a man, I can't respect this. Like she literally puts you through all of that. And then she's just gonna go back to the life that she wholeheartedly rejected in the first place. If it's the life that she rejected, then why does she decide to go back to the village? Like John, you were literally debunking your own points. Belle finds her father, update, he's still dying. And now there's an angry mob coming to lock Belle's father in the insane asylum. Yeah, and who organized the mob, John? It was Gaston. So once again, how is this heroic behavior? She exposes them to her occult mirror prop and tells them about this mythical creature because she wants them to think that her father isn't actually crazy. And she wants to get the townsfolk to indulge in her occult bestiality fantasy with her. What? Gaston begins basically like rhetorically psyoping the townsfolk to garner support for his cause, basically just like inventing these bad outcomes that could potentially happen to scare people. So he's lying. Are you pro-lying, John? And because he's respected, within seconds, the men are marching with Gaston to the castle to kill the beast, singing Gaston's praises the entire way there. They're singing, we're counting on Gaston to lead the way. You say that and you seriously think Gaston isn't a narcissist. Whereas Gaston literally just makes up a few stories and within five minutes, he has an armed caravan about to storm the castle. They've got a song prepared. And because Gaston is a true aristocrat with honor, he tells those below him that they can have whatever they can find for themselves. So Gaston Gaston is telling his people to steal from the castle. Yeah, that's a very heroic thing to do. But then Gaston finds the beast, and the beast, seeing an arrow aimed at him, he literally turns away because he's pouting over a woman. So Gaston tries to kill a defenseless animal, who is actually a person. And so then the beast lashes out and almost kills Gaston, out of insecurity, not out of Belle's best interest. Yeah, beast almost kills Gaston in the end, but he spares him, which is typically what a hero would do. The beast didn't even defeat Gaston. At no point did he best guessed on in any capacity. He literally won via technicality. But that literally happens. You said earlier that the beast almost killed Gaston. The beast didn't even defeat Gaston. And so then the beast lashes out and almost kills Gaston. Which is true because the beast won the fight against Gaston. <laughs> So then Belle says that she loves him, the curse breaks, and now the prince is back through this shape-shifting ritual, and guess what? He is significantly less handsome than Gaston. I mean, like, beauty is subjective, but since you have a Jesus statue on your desk, I would think that you would like the appearance of Beast, since he is supposed to look Christ-like. Alright, so that was finally the end of this awful video. So clearly John Doyle's theory of Beauty and the Beast being implicitly right-wing is mostly made up in his head. Listen, I have no problem with people interpreting art in their own way. I would not be making this video if I thought John Doyle's opinion on this movie was substantiated to some extent. But John is deliberately omitting aspects of the film and projecting his own beliefs onto it, just to fit his own narrative. 
narrative, which is not proper film analysis. Women know in their hearts that women cannot make decisions. Well, this Send the hand.